Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Carol Ortenberg, and I'm the editor of Nosh.com. I'm joining you from my home in Boston, and we're continuing our coverage and conversations about the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the food and beverage industry. As part of our series of video interviews about the effects of this rapidly changing situation, today we're going to be discussing how leaders of fast-moving food and beverage brands can balance a growth mindset with concerns about a potential slowdown in their business due to the economy. Joining us now from Boulder, Colorado, is Jane Miller, CEO of Lily Sweets. Since taking the helm of Lily's when private equity firm VMG invested in the brand in 2018, Jane has helped the company grow, expanding beyond its flagship line of low-sugar chocolate bars and baking chips into new categories, including confection and most recently snack. Along the way, Lily's has grown to be sold in over 24,000 retailers and added over 40 employees. We're really excited to have you here today. Jane, first and foremost, how is Lily's doing? How are you doing? Carol, thanks so much for having me on uh, the interview today. It's really a thrill to be able to talk to you about what's happening with the team. Um, I'm doing great. Thank you. We just had a huge snowstorm here in Boulder, so we're uh, under about a foot or so of snow. Um, and my team, I think for the most part, is doing as well as can be expected. Everybody's been at home since about March 13th, obviously no business travel, and uh, just kind of keeping the business running. So it's been a, a challenge probably like every other company to kind of get new ways of working. But I think we're I think we're getting along okay. Now you launched a new product last week. Uh, has to be an interesting experience. What was it like launching a product into retail amidst uh, this situation? So we launched into 30 Costco's a totally new item last week, which was a chocolate chip cookie. Uh, you know, no sugar added, uh, 100 calories for three cookies. I mean, it's a great tasting, amazing, crispy cookie product. And so the launch part wasn't unusual. It was the typical sell into a buyer, get the PO, get the product to the distribution system um, center, then get it to the store. The, the unknown part is what's going to happen now. Because uh, when we originally put our plan together, you know, Costco is such a great venue for people trying product live. And unfortunately, because of you know, part of the circumstance today, there's no longer any sampling. And so people are going to need to try the product without having to had a chance to sample it in store. So we, it's still too early to tell. We've only been in the stores about five days, but we're cautiously optimistic. So the launch wasn't any different, but now that it's in store, we're not sure what's happening with foot traffic and buying patterns. We've heard a lot about unusual situations that you don't normally have to deal with when it comes to distributors or trucking or shipping. How has that been for you with getting product into stores, especially this new product? You know, we have been really blessed with an amazing supply chain. Um, my head of operations, Phil Mason, is in contact all the time with uh, our commands, where it all starts, uh, and then within our, our warehouse and distributed system. And then uh, our sales team has been really on top of all of our key distributors. So we have been really fortunate in the sense that we don't think there were too many out of stocks, especially during the really rapid kind of hoarding time, uh, and that we've been able to fulfill all of the orders at 100% uh, as of last week. So let's go back. It's only April, but it feels much later in the year, I think. Um, you know, go back to January or February. This launch was clearly pre-planned already. You were thinking about it. What did your forecast for growth and what 2020 was going to look like for Lilies? So we had a pretty aggressive plan. You know, I can't share the exact numbers, but I can, you know, just sort of say from a growth standpoint, we were hoping that we would be, you know, somewhere in the 25 to 30% range over last year, you know, just conservatively. And at this point, you know, we just redid our forecast yesterday, trying to understand where we might land the business. And it's so hard to tell. You know, again, we're right on where we thought we would be at this point in time, but there's so many unknowns about retailers pulling promotions, delaying resets how consumers are going to be shopping differently, uh, maybe shopping less so they're not going into stores. So we're cautiously optimistic about this year that we're still going to have the same kind of growth, but we've been doing a lot of planning around if for some reason people stop eating chocolate or it really starts to um, impact our sales, how are we prepared for that? 
And until uh, this pandemic came up, were you tracking along your projections? What had you kind of done to to prepare the company for this period of growth in terms of thinking about staffing or product or distribution? So we've been adding staffing pretty quickly. You mentioned in your opening comments that we now have over 40 employees. And uh, we've been very aggressive in the last year. Uh, I'd say aggressive and cautious. Aggressive in the sense that we know we need to add people, but cautious in, in terms of not trying to get in front of our skis, in terms of getting too many people on board in front of the growth. And so, you know, our biggest challenge with a high growth business is making sure that you have uh, plenty of product and in inventory that you really can deal with surges in demand or slowness in demand. And I think what we've done, we have a great planning team, uh, both a sales forecasting and a production planning team. And I'd say we've been very, very um, conservative, conservative being trying to be long on inventory so that we don't have to cut anybody short. And so it's become a lot more complex because just two years ago, uh, when I stepped into the role, we only had uh, 12 candy bars and one baking chip. And now I think we have uh, over 40 products uh, that we've got in the system now. So it's a lot more complex to be able to forecast. But I, I think the secret for us so far has been to be in a situation where we're carrying a little bit more inventory on hand so that we can really deal with spikes in volume. And that's interesting you mentioned that because I know we were discussing the fact that you had already prepared and had a little extra inventory on hand uh, just to ramp up for this growth. Um, you know, what does that supply of product look like now? It still looks really good. I mean, all of our manufacturing partners have uh, are still running. You know, some of them with reduced shifts, uh, and some of them on a little bit different schedule. But we haven't had any interruption of product. So we had product built up, and we're able to kind of keep on the cadence that we had to be able to continue to have that sort of buffer of inventory uh, to be able to manage if there's spikes in growth. Now, you kind of alluded to this a little bit in that we don't know what uh, the future holds in terms of the economy. What, um, you know, if there was an economic slowdown, how do you see that impacting potentially your business or just the chocolate category in general? Well, we're, we're hopeful that uh, with people staying at home and not being able to go out, that chocolate might be one of the go-to things that, uh, that people uh, eat. Uh, I started my career at Frito-Lay, and we used to say back in the day that when times are good, people eat chips, and when times are bad, people eat a lot of chips. And so I'm kind of hoping that the, the candy, candy category is, is very, uh, very similar to that. That's our hope, but you know you don't run a business on hope. So what we have done is very uh, cautiously gone in. We have a great CFO, Lana Borden, and she's gone in and really looked at a bunch of scenarios. So if for some reason people are not eating chocolate, um, or if they say, "Hey, you know, you guys are low sugar chocolate, and now I'm going to eat all the sugar I possibly can because the world's coming to an end," and that impacts our business, uh, we want to be prepared for that. Um, because it's super important that all of our employees feel secure in their jobs uh, and their benefits and that we are running a business in a way that we can understand what how we cover our fixed costs. So we've done a lot of scenario planning, have gone in and looked at things that we can cut if we need to. Um, and I think we're in a pretty good situation um, in terms of being able to prepare for any kind of a downturn. That, I mean, that's a difficult process to undertake. How do you advise business owners to go about thinking about where they can make those cuts and, and really take a hard look at their business? Well, first of all, I'd say, especially for, for people that might be new in the industry and running a business that uh, might be uh, uh, in the earlier stages, first of all, making sure that you're surrounded by a really good advisory board of people that can give you advice. I and mean, we're, we're really fortunate. And I have the best uh, senior team in the industry. I've already mentioned Phil and Lana, and I think you already know, you know, Seth Manette, my head of sales and Sarah Mice, my head of marketing. So, I mean, I'm surrounded by direct reports that are so conscientious and so amazing, but I think most small businesses don't have the luxury of having that kind of talent underneath them. So I would say the first thing is make sure you have, you're surrounded by some sort of an advisory board. And that's not necessarily the same as a board of directors. It's people that you can reach out to, like myself, like other people that have long time um, standing in the industry that would be glad to give you some advice 
or some thoughts on kind of how to prepare. I, you know, I think it's, um, so beyond that sort of, you know, kind of macro, I think the micro is literally going through every line of the P and L and just being really religious about how you're spending money. Um, really looking at the profitability of SKUs during times like this, you really need to weed out things that have lower gross margins. So they're not sucking time or resources from, you know, the rest of your product line. I think being really choice fill about promotions um, and what you're doing in terms of being able to support the product uh, at store level. And that's tricky because you don't want to back off, um, especially if you're doing any kind of a new product launch. And I think being really conservative uh, about spending money, both on a marketing and a people standpoint, and trying to do more with less, uh, which is really, you know, I think probably the, the rule overall for every line of the P&L. That does sound like a really tough place to be as a leader, though, where you're planning for growth on one hand, but you're also worried about the future. So how do you kind of reconcile the two in order to just make a plan where you're moving forward every day? Well, it really is. Uh, it's really like the tale of two cities, because on one hand, you're so optimistic about growth and you need to have that inventory. On the other hand, if things were to go down, you want to make sure that you haven't made commitments on things that you didn't need to do. And so we literally are talking every day because, you know, as you said, it feels like we've been doing this a lot longer. And it's just the, the, the rate of change that's happening is, you know, in my 35 years in the food industry, I've never seen so much change in such a short amount of time. And so as a senior team, we are talking every day, what do we know new? What's happening with store traffic? What's happening with consumption? You know, what is happening with our commands and just having this continual dialogue about what's new. I mean, the best example, Carol, is what we're seeing from a, an e-commerce standpoint. You know, again, everyone's experiencing this, but you know, as a company, we didn't have a lot of focus on e-commerce. We were really focused on bricks and mortar and we're really focused, um, although we had a really nice Thrive business and Amazon business um, and other you know, great e-commerce businesses, we were more focused on the sort of the retail application. And what we've seen over the last month is the consumer is not going to let that exist. <laughs> we really need to be great at e-commerce. And we're lucky we have a great partner that we're working with in terms of getting product out to consumers. But we're shifting a lot of our tactics to really look at digital coupons, being online with the customers, realizing that someone is going to go to Kroger.com or Walmart.com, you know, or you know, on Amazon to make order their products as opposed to going in the stores. Jane, I know every day you're probably making hundreds of decisions right now. So how do you decide uh, which path sort of leads the way, at least first and at least right now? You know, is it focusing on that high growth mindset or is it, you know, thinking about the what ifs of the future? So, Carol, as you're asking the question, uh, the only thing I could come to mind is I really feel like I'm a coach on the sidelines in the Super Bowl. And I've got my headset on, and I've literally, I'm literally looking at the plays on my arm, and I've got, okay, Seth, what have we heard from retailers? Sarah, what's happening from a digital standpoint? Has e-commerce changed? What's going on? Uh, but seriously, literally every day we're talking about what's changing in the business, what's different, what's new information that we have. And my philosophy is, we make the best decisions we can with the information we've got at the time. And so we can't make a bad decision, really. It's just we're making it with the information that we've got. So it's very fast moving. To answer your question more specifically, we really are trying to get uh, prepared for growth, but doing it in a way that's fiscally responsible. So just really thinking about everything that we're spending, but really trying to be prepared for growth. Um, you know, I think in recessionary times, going back to the question about like what happens with chocolate, you know, I actually think that people are going to be eating more. And I think being kind of prepared for that uh, is super important. So it is a balancing act between growth and trying to maintain spending. But I think part of it is being super agile and just taking in information as you get new information. Not every company innately has those skills of agility. Uh, how do you kind of build those right now on the fly? Oh gosh, I think it's um, I think it's really being tuned into what's happening. You know, really making sure that you're not spending too much time thinking about 
how the, the pandemic is spreading and more time trying to understand consumer behavior that's happening in stores. And so much of this information is readily available that you really can go online and see what's happening with store traffic. You really can, you know, really access, well, great sources like NOSH in terms of what are happening in terms of overall trends. And just staying really tuned into that um, over the next, you know, couple of weeks. And I think that's part of the agility and not feel pressure to make decisions that are going to last for three months or six months. I mean, we started talking yesterday about our next board meeting and starting to talk about 2021. And my staff looked at me and said, we don't even know what's happening next week. How can you have us start talking about 2021 at this time? And it was a really good pushback to sort of say it's changing so much that I think agility comes from that being really connected with the change and being willing to change and not trying to think too far out at this point. Jane, I think your point about staff is really important. Um, it sounds like having everyone on the same page is key for this plan to work. How are you keeping your staff uh, in line with what everything's going on while at the same time, I'm sure also, you know, not everyone needs to know everything, not wanting to overwhelm people with too much information. So I've really learned a lot, Carol, in the last four weeks. And I've, as I said, I've been doing this for a long time and I've learned some lessons that I never would have thought I've learned. And I think that you can't communicate enough. I mean, we, we are doing daily emails to the team to let them know just wins, things that are good with customers, what's happening with an Instagram post, uh, just safety procedures at our commands, uh, looking at, um, the big news is someone's going to have a baby or, you know, just any kind of wins that we've got. So we're communicating a lot more. We're doing weekly Zoom uh, calls with the whole company to kind of talk a little bit, not necessarily about like what's happening with volume or the business, but more talk about each other and sort of share stories about what they're working on for work, but what they're doing for personal life. So communication is really, really critical at this point in time. And so we're doing doing a lot of it. Um, and part of the reason is we want everyone who's at home to feel like they're a part of something bigger, to not be afraid when everything you, you see is so scary, to know that it's business as usual as much as it can be business as usual. And I think there's a calming sense when you know that customers are still taking meeting on Zoom, that customers are still taking new products the consumers are like thrilled when they try our new products, that all that's still happening in the world, even though there's a lot of um, sadness and, and other things that are happening outside of that. So communication has been, has been really, really critical. Well, Jane, I think there's some great takeaways there. And thanks so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I think we'll, we'll let you get back to the business of chocolate, but thank you again. And uh, say hello to the whole Lily's team for us. Great. Thanks so much, Carol. Be well. Hey, did you like what you just saw? Well, for more from BevNet or Nosh, hit subscribe or ding that bell.